Hey everybody, Ryan here. Welcome back to Plague Size Studios and to what has inadvertently evolved into a damn near feature length edition of Gear Curiosities. Today, we are talking about the little green toaster that could, the Kemper Profiler. <music> There's really no skirting around the subject. Today's video is going to be lengthy. Perhaps the longest video I've ever made on this channel. I have over half an hour of audio that I'd like to share with you that was either captured from the Kemper or uh, from gear that I'm comparing the Kemper to. There are a lot of topics I would like to discuss and contrary to what some people believe, I don't talk just to hear myself talk. I do try to go over things that other people don't discuss uh, talk about things like workflow or comparative value with other products on the market at the time of release or uh, in the time that I've recorded this video. You know, things that you'd have to gamble several hours of your life away perusing random forums to try to find out, and even then, there's no guarantee. So, I try to save you time in the long run by discussing some of these things. But either way, I'll have this video time stamped to death so you can skip through it and see some of the things that. Uh, you know, maybe that you're particularly interested in if you're not interested in the big picture. But uh, the big picture is what we're here to talk about today. So before we get rolling, I think it's important to uh, mention the things I'm not going to be talking about before we get in, into the uh, kind of my test plan, if you will. So first things first, the Kemper cabinet. This is kind of the 1x12 FRFR slash modeling speaker hybrid that can accompany any version of the Kemper Profiler, whether you have the head or the rack or the floorboard, powered, unpowered, whatever, there's a model that will work standalone with your unit. And basically, they introduced a few firmware versions ago a speaker imprint that kind of acts as a well, speaker profile, uh, and it's not meant for direct use. You put this through the speaker, and it turns the Kemper cone into something that sounds like either a V30 or a greenback or a creamback or what have you, several different models of that. Um, I would just prefer to play you know, an amp modeler through the cabinets I already own, but I think it is a really good technology and if um, you know they came out with like a two by 12 vertical or especially a big beefy four by 12, then that would be really interesting. You could buy the cones and make your own, of course, but uh, that is one aspect that I'm not gonna really be talking about because there isn't really a direct comparison to be made in a lot of other modeling gear. The Line 6 does have power cabs as well. So um, something to consider if you're an amp in the room kind of player only, but for today, we're gonna be talking about this thing in direct applications. I'm also not gonna go too in depth in terms of the navigation of this unit. It kind of does what it says it's going to do per button. You know, if you press an amplifier block, it turns off the amplifier. If you hold down on it, it goes to that sub menu. All the rotary knobs are, are labeled, especially all the, uh, the soft buttons here. It's pretty easy to navigate, and uh, I don't think you really need any of the accompanying software to operate this unit most of the time. I do like Rig Manager, uh, especially having all of the global profiles available to you. That's definitely something I think Line 6 and Fractal could work on, where instead of having to go to a random website to download stuff one at a time, you can literally see like 17,000 profiles that people have uploaded, click on it, and you're rocking on that sound already. So that's fantastic. Uh, but as far as the actual editing of the unit with the workflow, and some of the limitations thereof, this is fine, quite frankly. And I, I really liked the break from a floorboard modeler or a desktop VST plugin 
to uh, have some physical knobs and, and turn some dials. It's kind of cool. So we're not going to go too in depth in that because it, it is pretty easy to navigate despite the um, relatively low resolution screen, uh, you know, in terms of 2021 resolution, it's still perfectly adequate though. And lastly, though, there will be a section on this towards the end of the video. I'm only going to scratch the surface of the wet effects like modulation, delay, and reverb. I feel like that's going to be better service in another video where I can have some direct comparisons between some other things that are out there, but uh, we will, you know, go over them quickly and kind of on a high level. They all sound really nice. They are um, not all comprehensive in, in terms of some of the stuff I like to see, like there's no Roland Dimension model on here, but like some of the delays and reverbs sound fantastic. The workflow kind of feels more like a pedal with some of the limitations, and some of them do not have limitations. They're a little overwhelming, quite frankly, without the editor, but they have a nice selection here, and I, I just want to point that out right at the beginning, because when you have a name like the Kemper Profiling Amp, some people might think, well, you know, the modulation delay reverb drives all that's going to be a write-off. That's not the case at all. That maybe when it was just a legacy delay or reverb model at launch, they weren't anything special and you kind of needed outboard gear. But today, I really don't think so. If you're cool with the dry tones, you're I almost guarantee you're going to be cool with the, uh, the other effects that are on board. With that said, today, I'm primarily focusing on those dry tones, amplifiers, cabinets, some dry pedal, even a little bit of fuzz pedal action in there. And uh, I think that is, you know, kind of to be expected, again, when you have the name Kemper Profiling Amplifier. In terms of the sounds you're going to be hearing, the things we're going to be discussing today, you're going to hear several custom presets that I've downloaded from Rig Exchange, kind of the, the things that are available to anyone if you have a Kemper Profiler. Um, we're going to go through the profile creation process, talk about some of the best practices or quirks or limitations thereof, compare it to the source amplifier, as well as a couple different methods of creating a profile, because there are a few different types that can get a little confusing for newcomers. I'll compare some custom profiles that I shot of my actual amplifier collection with those real amps, including stuff from an almost entirely solid state amplifier to, you know, like a five, six gain stage madness like the Mesa Mark IV, so you have a pretty good variety to judge how this thing works in a workflow that I would use it in, uh, which would be primarily direct profiles and impulse responses. Then we'll listen to some of the latest Kemper firmware additions with the Kemper drive model and the Kemper fuzz, going over those in kind of different clean and driven applications. And then finally, we'll uh, have to listen to some of the wet effects, as I called them earlier, like compression, modulation, delay, and reverb before I wrap this thing up, which is uh, going to be a while from now. So grab some popcorn, your favorite beverage, and uh, try to suffer through my stuffy voice. Believe it or not, there are other illnesses that still exist outside of uh, COVID-19, rhinoviruses, you know, uh, the common cold, seasonal allergies. So um, yeah, it's okay. I'm not dying. I'd like to kick this off with some of those custom profiles that you can download from Rig Exchange because I feel like this is kind of an encapsulation of all of the features and the things that uh, really make the Kemper Profiler what it is. This is very much one of those features that fans of the Kemper kind of use as a gotcha for fans of other amp modelers or uh, software because the Kemper does not have models, so to speak, when it comes to amplifier cabinets. Like you can go to, let's say, pull up this drive section here. There's a distortion and you can flip through. And over here on the left, you'll see there are actual models. So, you know, you go to the distortion section, you've got stuff like a, a rat model, a TSA-808. You've got uh, the Kemper drive, which kind of encapsulates a lot of different sounds in one. But if you go to the amplifier block, you have presets in the box when you buy this thing. Uh, that you can flip between like a plexi sound or an AC30 sound or what have you. But you'll notice they're not models in the traditional sense because there is a gain based middle treble, but these are not amp models in the same way that we're used to dealing with, you know, a fractal audio device or a Line 6 pod or an Ignite amps plugin where they physically model in real time or as close to real time as possible the schematic of an amplifier, the behavior of the preamp tubes or power ramp tubes or the output transformers at these different settings. You know, when you turn a potentiometer on one of those, whether it be the, the drive or the base middle treble, that corresponds to an actual potentiometer in that virtual circuit, that virtual schematic layout. That way, if you go from, let's say, three to seven on the drive pot on a JCM 800 model, it should behave 
pretty closely to the way a real JCM800 would behave going from three to seven, you know, within the tolerances of the components and the tapering of the pot and that sort of thing. But the bright switch should still be doing its job. It should, you know, be filtering the right amount of frequency content and, and have a similar amount of distortion and saturation increase. That's not really the case with the Kemper Profiler because yes, I can adjust the treble, I can you know, scoop the mids, I can turn up the gain, but it doesn't behave the same way the amp would because this is all kind of pre and post amp block, if you will. The EQ takes place after the amplifier sounds. It's not really built in like a tone stack because if you profile an amplifier, let's say with all the, the knobs at 10, you know, 10, 10, 10, across the board, you can still add bass middle treble. The, the profiler doesn't know what the settings of the amplifier are, so it's just kinda giving you some parameters to play with after the fact. It does take a stab at gain, because if you have a completely clean amp, it'll show the gain you know, way back here, or if it's really high gain, way up here. But dialing back the gain doesn't really tighten up a flubby amplifier, it just turns down the distortion. That is all to say, if you want an accurate representation of different amplifier permutations, you know, let's say uh, a, a rectifier type amp all at noon versus rectifier, you know, kind of at sweet spot settings, you have to take separate profiles for each one of those settings, which is why if you go online, you'll oftentimes see profiles labeled like gain six and then four, five, seven for the tone stack and then six, three, seven for uh, this permutation because you can go in and tweak afterwards, but it doesn't have the same effect as if you capture the amp with those settings. That does add a little bit of complexity to what is otherwise a simple turn of a dial on other amp modelers. But the real question is, can it still sound good with this approach? And uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a pretty simple question to answer. It very much can sound good.
hopefully these sound demonstrations prove that the Kemper is certainly not a one-trick pony. You can get a huge variety of clean, edge of breakup, crunch, mid-gain, high-gain, super saturated, off-the-wall tones from this one device. I don't listen to those things and think, yeah, that's definitely coming from one device, you know what I mean? Uh, it is as diverse as about any other amp modeler out there. It really depends on the source tone. Uh, so you've kind of shifted the bottleneck, so to speak, from whatever is included in the box with something like a, a fractal audio modeler or a Line 6 modeler to whatever is you know available to profile plus how good this is, how capable this is at recreating it. So that's why, you know, there's no dedicated Sansamp model or an HM2 going through a clean amp model, but the Kemper doesn't care. It's just going to take that sound and mold around it to its best of ability and, and recreate it. And that is something that, again, um, does stand above a lot of uh, more rudimentary tone matches or things that are provided by other amp modeling companies. If there's not a Randall RG100 model, yeah, you could probably tweak a bunch of stuff and get closer, but at the end of the day, you're still running a tube amplifier model and something like a, you know, a fractal audio axe effects and just kind of trying to get it to sound closer to that. Whereas this, I think does a pretty commendable job of separating the solid state sounds from, um, you know, tube amplifier sounds. With that said, in my opinion, there are still some telltale signs of the Kemper profile versus maybe other amp modeling solutions out there. And the first of which has entirely to do with the user base and nothing to do with the profiler itself. Um, a lot of the high gain stuff especially, and even the lower gain um, offerings, reek of SM57. <laughs> and uh, I, I try to avoid that myself in some of uh, the, the stuff that I've created to you know, share in this video. But it makes sense because the Kemper Profiler is a guitarist-centric product. So a lot of the guitarists that are gonna use this thing have some amplifier combo or half stack that they want to capture, but they probably don't have a big suite of outboard gear. They don't have you know stuff like a, a Neve console or a compressor or you know all these beautiful ribbon microphones or a mixer to sum it all together. So most of the time, during the capture process, what you're hearing is a single SM57 or similar dynamic microphone plugged straight into the Kemper, and that's your line in. And that's good that it can do that. It is nice that it is built around that use case, but uh, ultimately, that is why a lot of the full profiles you hear, you know, amplifier plus cabinet, sound that way, uh, and maybe are a little ice picky and brighter compared to you know some of the stuff out there that you might have compared it to because it has to do with the setup of the amplifier not necessarily what this is capable of. So all this opens up a, a whole mountain of questions like how does a Kemper profile actually work? How does it ascertain the tonal qualities of a single rectifier head going through a Mesa 4x12 and an SM7B microphone if there's not a single rectifier model or if there's not a, an impulse response of that already. And the dirty little secret with all of this, uh, as uh, hopefully will be proven as we go through the profiling process, is that profiling and modeling is the same shit, but different workflow. What do I mean by that? Well, there is a digital component to the Kemper, right? It's not just pulling all of these values or these tonal qualities out its ass. It, it just can't. <laughs> it's not a magical computer. There has to be some underlying foundation for it to work off of. And the going theory, and again, this can only be proven by Kemper, not us, but the going theory, based on some software digging and direct comparisons, that there is anywhere between six and 12-ish Kemper amp models under the hood. Now, we can't access those. It's not like we can you know, pull up some software and go, I want to play Kemper clean amplifier model number two or high gain amplifier model number three. It doesn't work that way. It uses that fundamental foundation to then figure out a closest match to whatever you're profiling through. So again, the going theory is that there's probably some basic blackface circuit in here. There's some basic Vox style circuit in here. There's some basic Marshall Plexi-ish 2204 style circuit in here. And based on those, when it listens to an amplifier, and especially a cabinet, 
it will figure out all of the EQ tweak differences, all of the gain stage differences, and compensate for those. Because ultimately, when it comes to something like an Axe FX, maybe half those models are truly redundant. If you had access to all of the advanced parameters that, that you know the software developers do, you could absolutely compensate for the differences between a stock 2204 and something like you know a Cameron Atomica. Because an awful lot of amplifiers that we think are different really come from the same circuit topology. So if you add a little more gain here or sprinkle in a little more bass there or change the power tube bias or whatever, you get a fundamentally different amplifier sound even if the schematic is relatively the same. So again, it is very possible, if not pretty much proven at this point, that the Kemper is basically listening to you know this range of high gain amplifiers, boiling it down to one circuit with some EQ changes before and after different gain stages. So is that good enough? Does that miss some of the qualities of amplifiers? I think a little bit of yes. I think this has done a phenomenal job of distilling what is at a core of an amplifier tone, but it certainly doesn't get everything 100% perfectly, in my opinion. Same thing goes with the cabinet sound. For all intents and purposes, it sounds like it's shooting an impulse response as it profiles, at least for those with a cabinet. And whatever inaccuracies might exist individually with the amplifier and cabinet modeling kind of disappear when they get married together at the end here with a full profile, that is. So let's have a listen to just that. Uh, we're going to shoot a profile of my single rectifier and kind of give you an overview and you know the, uh, the general how-to when you plug a dynamic microphone directly into this thing and uh, hook it up in kind of a, a three cable method, as it were.
Before I expand too much on my thoughts when it comes to profiling, I do want to at least point out a couple of my biases or things that I look for when it comes to AMP modeling, um, kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from. So the whole reason I wanted to get into the AMP modeling space in general when I was, you know, still a very intermediate, you know, lower level guitar player just starting out was because I would heard all these sounds from albums that I really enjoyed that I thought there was no way I could reproduce that with anything that I could afford, period, or anything that even existed in the analog domain, whether it be a, an actual amplifier half stack and, and a great collection of pedals. There were certain tones I heard and thought, holy shit, that just sounds otherworldly. Like, you got to have something digital to create that. And I found a lot of those tones there. But then what I also found is that a lot of the sounds I like or ones that were pretty much in that same ballpark, you actually can achieve with a boosted you know, analog amplifier. And in, in fact, it sounded better to me in a lot of ways. Or blending, you know, several variations thereof was what I was actually going for all along. So I kind of judge modeling gear in two ways. Can it reproduce the things that I want it to reproduce from the real world, shall we say? But also, can it go beyond that? And can it do new and interesting stuff or at least uh, perfect those sounds, polish them, do something that those cannot in the box. So that's kind of how I'm going to approach the Kemper. Can it, how well does it do either one of those categories of things? So when it comes to setting up a profile versus setting up a, you know, a patch on an AX8 or an FM3 or a PodGo, I do find I arrived at the finished sound faster in terms of trying to match an actual amplifier a lot of the times. You know, when you've got something mic'd up and ready to go already, it's kind of trivial. You plug into it, you hook up a microphone or mixer or whatever you have, you chug for a couple minutes, it does its thing, and you're done. I mean, that is the sound. It is that easy. Um, there are certain times I feel like it just does not cooperate. You know, I feel like that was a fairly straightforward approach here, high gain amp, kind of traditional cabinet, but there are certain scenarios where I had a hard time, if not an impossible time, to capture what I was hearing through the real amplifier, where the Kemper just could not figure it out. If it was a clean amp, or if it was high gain all the time, you know, something like uh, the Rhythm 2 channel on my Mark IV, I had a really cool edge of breakup, like super dynamic pick sensitive thing going on. We're on like a single coil, uh, you know, neck pickup. It was really bright, not brittle, but full. And then on the bridge humbucker, you know, you pick hard and you get some pretty decent crunch out of it. But the Kemper could not understand where that bright cap began and ended, and it just made everything high gain, and it sounded terrible. And no amount of refinement or volume changes could fix that. I just basically had to ditch those settings altogether. Um, there's a couple other edge cases like that that the Kemper, I've just not been able to get it to figure out. Uh, Mark IV as well had a couple settings where I was getting some really cool ghost notes out of it that I, I liked. You know, it was like an Octavia type thing on the higher frets, although it just wasn't a perfect octave. It was like, you know, a fifth or seventh up. And, you know, it was just barely there, but you can hear it. This doesn't really do ghost notes. It, it could not figure that out, which goes back again to what I was saying about kind of sanitizing or perfecting an analog sound. It very much still sounded like the amp. It just, none of the quirks were there because whatever fundamental modeling is under the hood can't handle it. And, you know, there are products out there like Fractal Cygnus modeling that does do ghost notes. Like I'm thinking like the Morgan AC amps. There's a couple settings on there that you dial it in on the real amp, you can dial it in on the Fractal and it does those ghost notes, which is pretty cool. So if you're one that appreciates some of the oddities of actual tube amplifiers, and there's a good chance that the Kemper profiler isn't going to be able to recreate some of those for you. The more egregious thing about the profile creation process to me though is refinement. And as you might have noticed as I was creating that last profile you saw, it's really not a big deal time-wise. It's just a requirement that I feel like should not be a requirement at this point. 10 years ago, when this was first launched as the breakthrough product that it sort of was, I can understand how a profiling process was not really perfected enough to not require some sort of guitar intervention. That it makes sense to me. 10 years later though, and I'm pretty sure the quad cortex, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, still involves this step. Uh, I'm not 
able to rationalize why this is even necessary. And more importantly, my issue with it is that it introduces the potential for human error. Because you might notice on like all the, the profile metadata, it'll say uh, what pickup and guitar was this created with. And I'm having a real hard time understanding why it should even matter. Because ideally, the profiling process should be comprehensive enough to figure out all of the aspects of the amplifier without needing to have a guitar plugged in at all, right? I can totally understand why, you know, just some sign sweeps and impulse responses and the different weird beeps and boops that this thing does make to uh, figure out the amplifier qualities maybe don't cover everything because ultimately it's going to be responding to a guitar signal. But why they have not incorporated something that sounds more like a guitar signal to ascertain those qualities is crazy to me. You know, the, the whole thing about this is if you plug in a guitar with EMGs and you refine a profile playing the same thing as a guitar, it's the same scale length with blackouts or a passive pickup and play the same thing and you get different results, then that means the profiling process is flawed because it shouldn't matter what guitar you plug in. Uh, it shouldn't matter that the guitar you plug in to the same profile sounds different because that's the way real amplifiers work. Obviously, if I plug in an EMG equipped guitar into my Chariot Tone, it's going to be pushed harder and sound different and be more focused than if I plugged in uh, you know, my Telecaster with a passive bridge humbucker. That's fine. But all other amp modeler manufacturers have figured that out. <laughs> it's schematic based, it's component based. So that's just a natural quality of amplifiers. The equivalent in the analog world of what I'm talking about here would be like every time I plugged in a guitar, a component value changed in the amplifier itself. Yeah, no kidding, the guitar sound is going to change, but the amplifier should not change. It should react to the guitar, but it should not change based on what guitar you're plugged into. That's kind of how the Kemper works. So I don't understand why they've not figured out a way to get the guitar out of the equation, because it introduces, again, a, a spot to screw something up. Whether you're chugging for a long time on like a drop A string on a seven string, or you're you know playing some dissonant chords or playing a lead passage, it affects the outcome of the profile. And I just don't think that's acceptable because that is, I feel like a lot of the reason that sometimes you get something that sounds like, oh my God, this is dead on. And then other times you get something that's like, it's just, it's not doing the same thing when I play in the upper register. Well, because you didn't refine it in the upper register. I just don't think that that's going to be something that is, is acceptable going forward uh, anytime that there is new profiling or capturing gear coming out. And if that's something that is fundamentally baked in to this architecture, maybe it's time for a Kemper 2, or at least to be talking about one. That brings us to the different types of amplifier profiles and how they compare sonically and functionality-wise to one another. So up to this point, you've basically been hearing a full-fledged profile. That is amplifier, cabinet, all shot in one session. You're basically hearing the output of a microphone stuck up to a speaker cabinet. All makes sense, right? But there are two other profiles that can be used in different ways. The first is the direct profile or DI profile, which is amplifier only. So you can capture this in a few different methods. Kemper sells a DI box that kind of breaks out your speaker line and attenuates it. Uh, and you can use uh, something like a Sur reactive load. In uh, my case, I actually just took the slave line out from the single rectifier as it was plugged up to the cabinet. That way it's still reacting to you know, vintage 30s in this cabinet, so the resonance and all that is right. It's not gonna get thrown off, but you're just hearing the amplifier. And that's useful for a number of reasons. Number one is if you play through a row cabinet, whether it be the Kemper cab or something like I have set up, you basically just isolate the amplifier sound and you've replaced the amp head in the equation, not necessarily the speaker cab, which is great for you know on stage or amp in the room types of setups and uh, can sound really cool. Now on the full profiles, you can disable the cab block, but it has no real way of knowing where the amp ends and the cab begins. It's gonna make some guesses. And the guesses are generally not too bad because for a lot of the full profiles, you can just disable the cab block and uh, it'll sound pretty decent through an actual cab, but you can tell there's something lo-fi about it as if it can't tell you know, what the power amp is doing versus the inherent you know, kind of characteristics of a cabinet. And that's where the merge profile comes in. So 
On a DI profile, you can turn a DI profile into a full, basically. Um, in you know, Ring Manager, I can drag and drop an impulse response, and ta-da, I have a full profile now. It sounds like a complete guitar signal chain. So if you're one of the people like me that have a, uh, a problematically large library of impulse responses, you can use DI profiles to a, a great effect. And that really does fit my workflow quite nicely because I, I like direct recording amp heads through a load box and using IRs afterwards. So that fits right up my alley. But you can also turn both the DIs and full profiles into separate blocks. That way you can mix and match after the fact. So let's say you've got a wall of amplifiers and a wall of cabinets, and you just want to shoot one profile at a time, but you want to be able to mix and match them after the fact. So basically, you capture a full profile like I did earlier. You save it. Then you capture a DI profile of the exact same amplifier, same settings, don't change anything, keep it hooked up to the same cabinet, but you want a line level tap off of basically the speaker jacks. Don't plug the speaker jacks into here, you will blow it up, uh, bad times. What you wanna do is have a DI box of some sort going between the amp and the cabinet or like a load box or a slave output. Capture that, save it. Then on your full profile, you can go to cabinet, copy, and then go back to your DI profile, paste it, and it'll ask you up here if you wanna merge the two. When you hit merge, basically it does some subtractive math and goes, hmm, if full profile minus DI profile equals cab, then cab plus DI profile equals full profile, okay, now we've separated the two. And you basically now have the ability to turn off each individual block and, and you have the equivalent of like an amp model and an impulse response in the Kemper world. So if you've got a whole lot of amplifiers and a whole lot of cabinets you want to profile, I would recommend that method. They are sonically identical if you do it right. I'm not even gonna show you what they sound like, it's pointless because they sound exactly the same. I think the more interesting question is, what if I have already shot a bunch of cabinet impulse responses because I wanna use them on outboard gear, I wanna use them in the DAW. It is the universal kind of accepted standard for cabinet modeling. Well, you can certainly use them on the Kemper Profiler and they sound pretty similar. I'm not gonna say exactly the same, but I'm also not gonna say that it has anything to do with uh, the Kemper being at fault because I shoot my cabinet impulse responses with a Matrix GT 1000 FX power amp. You know, it's a flat, neutral, solid state affairs, no weird impedance things going on. So in theory, it is the cleanest, you know, cabinet capture method there is. And in general, things tend to turn out a little, I would say, more produced and, and mix ready when I do it this way versus, you know, a full profile on the Kemper. So you'll probably hear, DI profile plus cab IR is a little brighter, a little more scooped um, than the full profile merge profile or even the full amp half stack. Does it sound worse? I don't think so. In fact, I think the IR sounds a little better and a little cleaner. It's just, a, it's a little bit different. But what I'm getting at here is either way you go, it's potential for really good results. To me, I would much rather just shoot DI profiles of all my amps, use the cab IRs I already have and go that route because that's the workflow I like. But if I was starting from scratch, I would probably just do what I was discussing earlier and shoot all the cabs and, and amps at, at once and then mix and match. So good results either way, you just might get a, a little bit of tonal difference. This is the part of the video that gets a little more juicy, in my opinion. So far, I think the Kemper Profiler has proven itself to be really commendable when it comes to capturing the nature of a full amplifier 
half stack signal chain, you know, the typical amp head through a cabinet, how I think a lot of people are going to use the Kemper profiler. There are little differences, again, a lot of which I think are attributable to the flawed refinement process, but for the most part, the little differences in low end versus, you know, maybe some scratchy high end, big deal. I don't really care about those minute things. You can probably EQ them out, and just because they sound a little different doesn't mean it sounds bad or even stop sounding like this amplifier. To my ears, they're still really comparable. And honestly, the microphone sagging on the stand over the next few days or bumping the bass knob is probably going to have a bigger effect. So bravo there. What we've not really looked at is just the amplifier modeling in isolation because that gave us a little glimpse of a DI plus a you know an IR, but that doesn't really tell us what it sounded like if we just compare it apples to apples to the amplifier alone. So with this next batch of demonstrations, I'm going to compare the real amplifiers that I profiled versus the profile thereof, the DI profile at that. We're going to send both of those signals through the same cabinet impulse response. I'm going to load up the cab IR and Cubase for the tube amplifier heads, and I'm going to import the cab IR to the Kemper profiler for those profiles because if we wanted to eliminate all variables, yes, I could put both of those through Cubase, but that doesn't tell us how 90%, probably 99% of people would want to use the Kemper, and that is to throw everything in on the device itself. So if there's any potential issues with the way it imports and converts cab IRs into Kemper you know, cab profiles, then you're gonna hear it here, but I think that is important to point out and is something that is realistic.
Do these samples sound close? Absolutely. I think you're out of your damn mind if you want to argue that they don't sound close. I mean, I, I can listen through headphones and nitpick some of the details, but the profile are delivered in spades in the places where it counts, in my opinion. If you're sitting in front of a mixed console and you're producing a record in kind of the, the typical fashion that we would uh, nowadays, you're not going to notice those differences. By the time bus compression starts stacking up and things are limited and hard clipped and you start EQing, it will not matter. Uh, if you get a good capture of the sound you're going for, you're not going to be able to tell the difference, whether it's you know a real amplifier or a Kemper profiler. Um, if you're at an outdoor concert standing in front of a blaring PA and the band rolls up with a Kemper profiler, I would bet it's going to sound better than the real amplifier because that has been the trend with all the recent bands I've seen. The last music festival I attended here recently, uh, I counted... I think five or six bands that I saw multiple Kempers, you know, at least one, but most of the time two or three for the bass guitarist and the two guitarists, whatever, in their back line. And without fail, they all sounded incredible. In fact, they sounded far better than all the bands that rolled up with a real half stack because what generally happens is you get the sound guys, ah, you know, chalk up the SM7 and, ah, and they're done. With a Kemper profiler, you have that sound baked in and you tell the sound guy, and most of the band, you know, these bands had their own sound guy to, you know, at most, a high pass, low pass, change the level, and it sounds incredible every night. And that was the case here. Putting our nitpickers cap back on then, what are some of the things that the Kimber Profiler struggles with, or maybe doesn't capture as accurately as one would hope? I think the first major hurdle is the Profiler has trouble distinguishing, in my opinion, in my experience at least, X number of gain stages versus X minus one gain stages plus a hard clipper stage or like a Jose style mod or using a distortion pedal up front because that is something you can do and it's something I'm not really uh, got into in depth in this video because we'll, we'll explore that uh, here in a moment. But you can put a distortion pedal in front of an amplifier and just profile the whole thing or you can just profile the amp and pull up you know the closest distortion pedal model on here and boost that profile with. But in saying that, something like a valve state, I think this is a, a really uh, good example of this. You know, it's got some transistor stuff going on. It's got some red LED clipping diodes going on. It's got even a, a tube gain stage or two on the OD2 channel. And the profile doesn't really capture all those nuances that the real amplifier exemplifies. It still sounds a little too tuby, which makes sense because there's probably not, you know, the fundamental architecture to support all those things at the same time. It's probably seeing the waveform and putting the, the closest match it can. In theory, you know, there should be some wave shaper or formula, some uh, big long string of equations that would account for all those nuances. But in reality, this is probably as close as it's going to get. Again, it still sounds good. It still has the valve state thing going on, but it's just a little different. And the same thing goes for something like a Jose mod clipper on the end of a hot rodded plexi, or you know maybe boosting a rectifier. Maybe some of those things get lost. With clean boost pedals, with pure EQ, even the slightest amount of symmetrical or asymmetrical soft clipping in front of an amp through like a tube screamer perhaps, I think the Kemper Profiler does a fine job capturing that. The rectifier profiles you heard throughout the beginning of this video, all boosted with EQ, sounded great. But some of the little gain stage nuances get lost, I think, for some of the more complicated circuits. Sticking with the theme of the Kemper can profile anything, one of the things that I did not show off and I'm not really going to dive deep into in this video is profiling other modelers. This device can do that. You can plug up an Axe FX and do exactly what I just showed you. Now, Kemper you know, has a disclaimer that's like, well, if you use other digital products, it probably is not going to sound very good because those things lack all the nuances of tube amps, whatever. Despite that, you can find fractal audio profiles by the dozens on Rig Exchange. I have made a few profiles of my Pod 2.0 just for fun. And again, going back to that previous point, it does a, a pretty decent job at approximating those things, even if they're not tube amplifiers. Uh, your mileage may vary on the distortion quality and all that. But the bigger takeaway from that exercise to me, and it's something that I've avoided in this video, is a complex mix of cabinet impulse responses. Because I have tried to profile 
let's say, uh, an amplifier plugin that I liked. You can even find like Ignite Amps and Neural DSP plugins uh, profiled on Rig Exchange. It's kind of cool. But if you mix too many cab IRs, even if it sounds good in the DAW, I feel like, and in my experience, it has shown that this has trouble with all the phasiness going on and the end result does sound wrong. Like something just fundamentally did not get analyzed correctly. So if you're going to try to profile stuff that is more complex, whether it be a, a big blend of microphones or a, another you know, piece of digital gear, then be wary of that. Maybe everything will work out fine, but you might have to play around with some phasing or um, streamline your cabinet module if that is something that you're interested in. Now, there are definitely some aspects of these Kemper profiles that do bother me. They're less than ideal, and they are, in my experience, consistent between amps, whether you know, you're profiling a cheap solid-state amp or you know a five-gain stage tube monster. They all kind of do these same quirks to some extent. And of course, refining and, and using different guitars, they will play into that. But it is a consistent flaw that you hear in certain ranges of the frequency spectrum that I, you can kind of produce over and over. And I feel like if they've not been identified by now, or maybe they have been identified, uh, then it's not fixable in this generation of Kemper. So you can kind of break this out into bass, middle, treble. And we'll start with the one that uh, bothers me the least, and that is treble. It's not so much of a consistent, oh, it's always too bright or it's always too dark. Again, I'm not so concerned about static EQ differences. You can EQ that after the fact if it's bothering you. It's more to do with the the pick attack, the overall uh, factor of, of sanitization for each of these profiles. You can kind of hear some of the amps raw by themselves sound a little nasty. And I wanted that, you know, like the, the 2204 low circuit that I was going for. Uh, that 1,000 picofarad bright cap and the higher presence was kind of making it bright and brutal and kind of cool. I like that. A little noisy. Then you get to the Kemper Profile, and the noise ain't really there, which is nice, but it's also cleaned up a little bit, as if a lot of the high-frequency content is getting nuked before the amplifier, like before the first gain stage, and then being made up for after the fact. It's hard to describe. You can also hear that in the valve state, where some of that crisp pick attack and uh, decay after each note disappears a little bit in the profile where it sounds a little fatter like you're running a solid state distortion pedal uh, that's been heavily filtered. Again, this aspect of the profile cleanup doesn't really bother me so much because it is a little more inconsistent. You know, I say all that and then you listen to one of the rectifier profiles and it was a little bit brighter than the reference. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly what's going wrong or right or uh, if it's just human error, again, with the refining process, but there is some inconsistencies in that way. The bigger issue than that, to me, has to do with the bass response after the amplifier, or you know, after the distortion stages, I should say, because to me, it sounds like a fundamental flaw in the way that the power amplifier is being represented. You know, if you want to kind of decouple the preamp and power amplifier, a lot of the times, if the power amp is not clipping, and in a lot of these scenarios, I kind of was running the power amp more or less clean, not so much with the, the chariot tone, but especially on the Mesa Boogie stuff, it wasn't hard clipping or anything like that, saturated maybe, but the power amp can really be defined by its output frequency response, which usually looks something like this, because that's what the speaker impedance curve looks like that it's seeing. And specifically with the surreactive load I use for all these amps, you can hear that influence of that kind of greenback looking impedance curve, especially on something with very little negative feedback like the single rectifier. Obviously, the effect is lessened uh, with more negative feedback in other power amps, but you can still hear the influence. And, you know, that output frequency response is going to very much look like that. Now, on the Kemper profiles, they seem to have the high end more or less figured out. There are certainly some of those improvements I think need to happen, like I talked about with the, the brightness of the pick attack and, and some of the things that I think are uh, being fully represented. But the static frequency response is, is pretty much right on the high end. The low end is kind of wrong and, and backwards, in my opinion. So you should be hearing this big resonant peak somewhere between 90 and 120 hertz. And then it kind of falls off after that. That is a very, you know, iconic signature tube amplifier thing. Whereas the Kemper Profiler seems to stay more or less flat in that region and then kind of shelf. 
Now, I'm, I'm kind of over-pronouncing this visually, but you can still hear this in direct audio comparisons where it sounds like the Kemper Profiler has been high fidelity eyes, if that makes sense. It's kind of the, the same side effect that less accurate reactive loads have, like the uh, older two-note stuff. And again, this isn't such a big deal because especially in a live environment and mixing, you're gonna be cutting a lot of the low end anyway, but I feel like that resonant peak still survives a lot of those low cuts and is a lot of the reason you do it. And it has more to do with the dynamics and the, the palm muting and feeling the, you know, just the thud every time that you scrape a string because there is some dynamic range that plays into that whole speaker reactivity. So I don't know why it's so consistent and how they've not been able to figure this out. Maybe they assume that it's gonna be the same sort of reactive curve for every single amplifier that they profile, but it's not the case. And it, it doesn't really capture my load box or even some of my other cabinet speaker reactivity curves very well. And that leaves us with the mid-range. And this is gonna be a multifaceted conversation because there's different parts of the mid-range that are problematic in different parts of the amplifier. And the ones that people get stuck on, I feel like aren't even that big of a deal. Starting with the infamous Every high gain amp sounds like it has a tube screamer stuck up front. Now, in fairness, I haven't really encountered that problem so much. Maybe it's the guitar selection or sticking with using the same guitar that I created that profile with. You know, if I created a profile with, with EMG81s, I'd try to use that one. Or if I use my Lundgrens, try to use that guitar. But I, I, downloading some of these free presets off of Rig Exchange, I can hear it. I hear what they're talking about, where it's like, you know, you plug into a real amp and it's not perfect. If you don't have a pedal up front, there's a lot of wrong things going on where it doesn't filter out some of those nasty frequencies in a DI, but that's what makes it sound cool. You can hear kind of the uh, ratty high end sneak in there sometimes. And for a lot of these profiles, sometimes it, it can creep through where it sounds like there's a big, you know, low pass, high pass filter being stuck on your guitar before it goes through. Now that can clean things up. It can even make things better in a live environment, but if you've already got kind of a, a honky scooped, um, you know, high pass filter thing going on anyway, for an amp that you're trying to profile, then you don't want any more help, right? And that can be problematic. Again, I, I only heard that a little bit with like the valve state and, and maybe the Mark IV to a certain extent, but that wasn't that big of a deal in my opinion. The next one people like to talk about is the inherent mid-range compression that the Kemper seems to have going on with basically every profile. Now, I think that contributes to its snappy feel. It is a fast feeling device, even faster than you know a lot of tube amplifiers in my opinion, uh, latency notwithstanding, depending on your digital setup, but it, it's, it's kind of like almost in solid state amplifier territory. And I think that's cool, it's, but it's still bouncy feeling and reactive to a certain extent. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Now you can simulate that effect in, in other ways, uh, whether it be with uh, amp modeling software or you know turning up your amplifier louder. But I think that's kind of what it's doing is simulating a sort of feedback within its own circuit network. And it's cool sometimes. Other times you can definitely hear like, okay, there, there's some more dynamic range going on in this amplifier that this thing is, is squashing or maybe uh, brick wall limiting is the, the better sound comparison. But I, again, I don't think that's too much of a problem, especially in a live scenario or even a recording scenario, kind of does some of that work for you. So everything still sounds good despite that potential problem, which again, I don't think is so much of a problem. The aspect of the mid range I take far more issue with is that every amp past like gain six and a half or seven starts to sound really samey to me. Now people might think, well, that, you know, my experience, that's just not the case. But if you listen to a bunch of DI profiles and use the same cab IR, you're likely to hear what I'm talking about. And yes, the output frequency response changes. Yes, the tightness or the chunkiness or uh, the fatness of the pre-gain stage EQ changes, obviously, it does a good job with that. But what I'm saying is it sounds like it's basically EQ matching all these different high gain amplifiers to the same amp model, and that's problematic. Now, I don't know that for a fact. I don't know that there is only one or two like actual high gain models under the hood, but I say this because you can take a VH4 profile, a VHT deliverance profile, a dual rectifier profile, and kind of tweak them to sound damn near identical beyond 
the extent that I think you should be able to in real life, or that I've proven that you can in real life. I mean, I have EQ matched you know, my amplifiers to one another and put EQ pedals before and after, and with the same cab IR, it's really hard to tell the difference. However, there are certain aspects about those amps that you can still hear, oh yeah, that's, that's still the rectifier. Like, you can hear the harmonics differences, you can hear the big dynamic low end because of that soft power amp. Those things don't really get captured very well on the Kemper. That, you know, really hard transient crunch of the Dietzel versus, you know, the, the fat bottom end and kind of like straining bright cap that you hear on a rectifier, even when they're EQ'd as identically as possible, those elements still come through. They don't really come through on the Kemper. Damn near every high gain Kemper profile starts to sound like an EQ match Marshall because the harmonic content is more or less the same and they all have that mid-range honky crunch underneath that makes it sound like whatever differences is trying to emulate were simply EQ matched for lack of better terms. So I feel like maybe there's not as much diversity in the fundamental algorithms as a lot of people would like to think. And this aspect of the high gain DI profiles kind of put a hamper on one of the potential use cases I had for the Kemper because I thought maybe I can hook this up to uh, an external power amp and kind of integrate it into my amp switch and have this be the every other amplifier, right? If I felt like jamming on a SLO or a VH4 or maybe a 5150 Stealth that day, I could just, you know, route that through one of my cabinets and it'd be more or less the same, kind of a cool amplifier style uh, form factor. And even though I kind of main my cherry tone, my Mesa Boogie stuff, you know, this would be a good compliment for that. That way I don't have all those amplifiers sitting collecting dust 90% of the time. But they don't sound different enough in the DI space to really, I think, justify that use case, unfortunately. So I think to get the most diversity out of this machine, you're gonna to wanna to stick to full profiles or merge profiles, something that uses different cab sounds because it kind of masks those issues. So isn't there anything we can do about this at all? Well, there are some advanced parameters, both the amplifier menu and the cabinet menu. There's even some kind of novel stuff, I think, like the high shift and low shift where it physically like shifts the low frequency content, high frequency content. And I don't know if it's like a, you know, like two juxtaposed band filters or something, but it sounds pretty cool when you do it. Uh, it's actually like changing the overall character of the cabinet. There are uh, character controls as well. I don't really use pure cab because this is kind of a, an elimination of high frequency not really aliasing, but garbage that microphones introduce a lot of the time. So if you kind of want a more amp in the room feeling, you can turn this up more on some of the uh, the profiles that you feel need it. It could sound good if you uh, want to experiment with it, but for most of the time, I keep that off. And of course, you have your standard EQ controls as well. So if you find something that is really close, but you feel like just needs a little bit of post-processing and you don't care that it may not be 100% accurate to the real amp at that point, then you do have some options at your fingertips. Let's venture past the amplifier profile discussion for a while and get on to some standard effects because once you get into the drives and the modulation, the compressors, the reverbs, these are kind of more traditional models in the sense that you have parameters to adjust. You know, if you go over here under distortion 
and you find the green screamer, then you can actually adjust the drive tone and volume. It's not just a profile thereof. But there are different presets that are included for all of these. So, you know, if I go through here, like under reverb, you'll have some, you know, legacy presets. You'll have like maybe a, a spring or a hall or different things that they've dialed in for you, more or less. Um, it'd be kind of like on Fractal if they included, you know, presets in the box in the little lower left tab that you have on AxeEdit. So the one I want to start with is the Kemper Drive. This was introduced about a year ago at this point, and it's kind of an all-encompassing soft clipper, basically. Now, you have the standard drive tone volume controls, but there are also definition, slim down, and mix controls. And these advanced parameters kind of determine the clipping qualities, the filtering that's going on in that particular drive pedal. And they've actually managed to include different presets for everything ranging from the TS-808 to the Horizon Devices Precision Drive to uh, Klon, King of Tone, you got the Blues Breaker, some other stuff that you know I, I would never even play with. The Timmy, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, Super Overdrive, the OD-1. And that goes to show you again that for these more simplistic circuits, you don't necessarily have to model every individual thing. They've tied some controls to be able to you know, get all those tones in, in one place. And they are very convincing and, the, and they sound good. But something like the Klon, it's technically a hard clipper, but where the gain control is a blend between a clean signal and a very softly uh, hard clipped signal with those silicon diodes, it kind of comes out sounding like a soft clipper anyway. So they fit that in. There's a really good uh, full tone OCD model in here, all that kind of good stuff. And if you don't care about, you know, having the exact same sound or setup as, as any one of those particular pedals can output, then you can just use this drive model as a create your own drive. And I like that. I think it really fits in with the aesthetic and the the overall ethos of this product where, you know, maybe the amp profile is a little tweaked and it's no longer exactly that amp. Who cares if it sounds good? <laughs> There's plenty more models built in here in the distortion and booster sections. You've got the uh, plus one, I wonder which one that one is, uh, the DS1, the, the muffin, hmm. the mouse, obviously a tribute to the rat, uh, the metal DS, you got treble boosters, lead boosters, pure boosters, but the one I want to go over more in detail is the Kemper Fuzz, which is the most recent distortion edition from firmware, and this is the same idea as the Kemper Drive, just with fuzz pedals. Again, there's a big muff model on here and some other dedicated ones, but with this, you can, again, create your own or go through the presets and you've got stuff that's like, you know, your standard fuzz faces, both in the germanium and silicon diode variety. So they've managed to kind of put that in a, an advanced parameter. Uh, you've got Octavia stuff, which doesn't do the perfect fold over sound to me, but it is it's still pretty damn good. Um, basically anything that you could not dial in with these standard models, you can do here. So I'm not a huge fuzz guy. 
I do like, you know, like a completely blown out sounding sun or orange amp with fuzz in front of it. But I feel like a, a lot of people, especially with amp modelers, keep buying fuzz pedals because of the impedance interaction and, and things that amp modelers don't always get right. And with this, stuff like the impedance low pass is modeled. And a lot of people that keep using Kemper profilers have said this has made them sell their fuzz collection because they don't need it anymore. So I think it's a really good addition. One of the remaining effects then, you know, if you're a drive pedal user like I am, two or three blocks is all you're going to need. And putting them in, in series, stacking, gain, this thing's got you covered. You got the A, B, C, D blocks before your amplifier, but once you start getting into some of the wet effects, I can absolutely see where people might start running out of stuff. Now you can put delay, reverb, all your wet effects before the amplifier if you would like. Don't let the X mod delay reverb thing fool you. Just because it says that doesn't mean you have to have that effects in that block. It's just where they suggest it, and it obviously does make things easy when you press mod and you know a modulation effect goes on and off. So uh, between that and your dedicated mix controls, that one of which is axed on the uh, rack profiler unit, it just makes sense just to keep it there if that works for your signal chain. Otherwise, you know if you're kind of like me, I think you're going to be able to fit most of everything you would need. You can do something like a compressor, a phaser, overdrive pedal or two. You got your amplifier, EQ, modulation, delay, reverb. It's probably going to look like a lot of people's signal chains out there. So I don't think for the general guitar player, the effects limitations or count or not being able to parallel blend is really going to be a problem. This is ultimately trying to model a, a normal analog rig. You want to get any crazier than that, you're only either need to buy a second Kemper, which I wouldn't recommend, or just go to an entirely different platform. Every one of these effects categories, just like the Kemper Drive and Fuzz, have different presets built in to get you started, which I think is a good way of going about this for each individual model. That way it kind of gives you a, a decent starting point and you can hear a range of capability throughout all of these. I'm going to be primarily showing off the compressor flanger, chorus, delay, and reverb capabilities because those are kind of the ones that I think make or break a lot of modeling gear. Um, I, I like stuff like the Bogner Harlow pedal for my compression. So if it can't do something like that, it's gonna be kind of a deal breaker. Again, I like a lot of those classic Boss or Roland um, Dimension CE1, CE2 chorus sounds, ping pong and true stereo delay, all that kind of stuff. So. I think for a lot of people, the Kemper is going to deliver in spades. And again, if I were the kind of person that would profile an amplifier sound to bring with me on tour, I would not have any issues using the effects on board for this.
Well, it's about that time, and I commend you for your strength and patience for reaching the conclusion of this video. So, what's there left to say about the Kemper? Um, there's a lot that goes into this. I think the form factor is really cool. I definitely like the head unit here. I would not be opposed to seeing a new Line 6, uh, like Flex Tone style head or an Axe FX head in this way because the, it does fit the desktop experience really well. Um, or even a rack unit that has this layout. The physical knobs are cool. I, I do like that. And I think it could make sense for some stuff. Um, without all of this, I would prefer just to go for the four, the floor stage version, though with the way that the Kemper works and, and hooking it up for profiling and all that, I do think I would still prefer the, the head for, you know, desktop use or, um, kind of integrating it with the rest of my tube amp gear, but there's something for everyone. And I do like that. I do like that there, there is a Kemper. When you say Kemper, it's the Kemper. It's not Axe FX. Two XL Plus Turbo, you know, supercharged. <laughs> it's Kemper, and I do appreciate that. I do like that they've been able to support this product for so long, and I, I think it does give a, a, a lot of credence to the argument that you know processing power is a threshold. If they can get something sounding good and, and accurate with something that is that was outdated ten years ago in terms of processing power, then who cares? That's all you really need, and I, I appreciate that they're not needlessly making new products and filling landfills with a bunch of stuff that could have been used. So I, I do commend them for that. Is that to say there's not room for a sequel at some point? No. I think I've proven that there are things about this that are simply outdated and not outdated in the sense that like, oh, all of a sudden it sounds bad. No, but there are things that it's just, it's not doing that some of the competition is doing, I, I think. Now, in terms of how I was going into this, ultimately, I was going to buy this to review and flip with perhaps the, you know, uh, the premise that I could keep it for, for other things, but it really depended on my, my overall time with it. And what I found is that this is not a creative or inspiring tool for me like other amp modeling can be, you know, with like fractal stuff and even to, with line six and a lot of VST plugins, the ability to turn knobs and have them do what the real amp does and move signal chains around and hear new sounds and crazy things that I didn't know, you know, could even be done. Uh, that is really exciting and really plays into songwriting and, and making me want to be a better guitar player. This not so much. The Kemper's role is all about recreating things that already exist. And like I said before, I, I'm kind of at a split path here where I judge modeling gear on its ability to do unique things, push the boundary of things that can be done in the analog domain, uh, as well as recreate them. And this just kind of only does the recreation part. And that's fine, but I already have everything that I need to do with that when it comes to real tube amps and other amp modeling gear. So I'm not finding this to be like, oh, let me plug in and write a bunch of songs with it. It's not happened at all in the past year or so that I've owned it. With that said, it has been a nice compliment to my workflow uh, when recording the project I'm working on currently. I liked plugging into this and being able to monitor an amp sound that was basically like 95% the sound I was gonna have on album without putting wear and tear on my real amplifier. Just shot a profile, made some tweaks, tracked with that, only actually recorded the, the DI, and uh, it's been really fun in that workflow. So I could foresee revisiting that with this or other modeling gear at some point. Beyond the tones and the inspiration, the most problematic thing about this unit to me has been its reliability. And I almost regret putting this at the end of the video, but I didn't want it to taint any of the sounds and you know a lot of this information is out there. But I, I don't know that I really would trust mainlining this thing for even occasional gigging because I've had a lot of issues with it. And you know maybe this is like an original unit from 2010, who knows, but um, firmware locking up, or rig manager just sucking sometimes. You know, I praise it for having the internet connectivity and being able to pull profiles from the cloud. That's awesome. But sometimes doing simple shit like renaming a profile and then switching to another one and then switching back, it doesn't save any of your changes or it'll change the cab on you or stuff will just desync. It's a nightmare sometimes. And I did have this one day where it just didn't boot. I didn't do anything different to it. It was unplugged. No way it could have had any electrical issues. 
And you know, one week I was playing, the next week I come back, try to plug it up, and it's just locked in an infinite boot cycle. And then you got to go through the firmware reset, and the first time that didn't work, and all this garbage. I finally got it back up and running. But I have never had that happen with not only VST plugins on a you know a computer system that has so many games and, and crap on it that I would expect something to go wrong here because they're developing for a million different hardware permutations. Um, I've never had it happen on a fractal device. Never even had it on my Line Six pods. Any of the ones that I've you know reviewed over the, the last couple of years, uh, but it happened on Kemper. So that's put a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, to be honest. With that said, big shout out to the Kemper support email for getting back to me within 24 hours, and that's accounting for the time zone difference between Eastern U.S. and uh, Germany. So that's pretty impressive, and, and they were helpful. So that does mean a lot to me. Um, but it does make me wonder if the firmware updates or, uh, you know, all, all the stuff they're trying to push this old hardware with, uh, you know, is it too stressful? Is this flash memory not reliable enough? I, I don't know. But with the current cadence of Kemper profiling products being released with the Kemper stage having come out just within the last two, three years, um, the Kemper cabs are rolling out. I don't foresee a new generation in anytime soon. I, I could see them still having a, a you know Kemper Profiler Plus or a two or something eventually, but I feel like they, they kind of got their heels dug in in terms of this is what we're going to do. This is the one thing you buy, and I do respect that. I do really respect it's like, look, we don't expect someone to buy a new version of this every five to six years. Um, I understand that with innovation, eventually you're going to run out of headroom. Eventually you, you're you out of CPU, right? I mean, you got to have new consoles come out every now and again if um, video games keep advancing. You got to have new Axe effects come out if you want to add more amp blocks and all this stuff. But I do respect their attitude in terms of you're going to invest in this once and you're never going to have to do it again. With that said, what I would really like to see from Kemper and all of the competition going forward is some combination of profiling and modeling, something where it could either intelligently pick between the closest model or you say, hey, I want to start on this one and, and get it as close as possible. Um, something that has a hybrid of effects where there's like generalized models as well as, you know, this is like the pedal model of the DS1, but here's also kind of the, the Kemper drive or the fractal drive, that sort of thing. I like the, the head form factor more than I thought I would, honestly. It is complementary to the floorboard and the rack and that sort of things. But overall, I find it very difficult to recommend the Kemper to people that don't already have it because it's been out for so long <laughs> that I feel like if you don't have the Kemper yet, there's probably a reason you don't have the Kemper yet. You know, I could very well see this being the perfect like tube amp nuts friend. You know what I mean? If you've already got a wall of tube amplifiers or you have that one amp that you've paid more than your car is worth for, um, that you're deathly afraid of taking out of the house, but you want to gig with that sound either you know once or twice a month, or, or maybe you're a semi-pro you know working musician. Then yeah, absolutely throw down thirteen, sixteen hundred dollars, maybe you know a few hundred dollars for the Kemper cab, uh, maybe a couple hundred bucks for the floor controller if you really want to be safe about it. And ta-da, you can basically take your sound with you. Uh, it is is literally that close, I think, a lot of the times. But if you're someone that's just kind of getting started with digital effects and you find that on free VST plugins, you like having that control uh, with the real amplifier drive, bass, middle, treble, if you like it reacting the way you would expect, if you like being able to blend multiple amps in parallel or different effects or sum them differently, all these things that the, the Kemper either outright cannot do or is not going to accommodate that workflow. You know, if you're starting from scratch, the only way that you can get new sounds on the Kemper is by relying on other people to make those new sounds. And I feel like the success I had in this video creating the sounds I did was because I had the stuff to dial in. Uh, it says less about, you know, me and, and more about the gear. So if someone is out there and, you know, that 5150 profile that you're searching for, that you've got to have that sound, maybe it doesn't exist. I mean, what if? You're, you're kind of shit out of luck at that point. So you, then you got to start going through all these forum posts or go to um, all these people that sell profiles. And, and that's something that I have a lot of mixed feelings on, too. On the one hand, I'm all about compensating people for their time, no matter what. 
I, I don't advertise it because I don't have time to do it realistically, but I have, for several clients, made profiles, um, look at me now, I'm saying profiles, made presets for Fractal Audio gear because they liked the way I dialed in sound and said, hey, can I get something that sounds like this, this, and this, and you know, I'll, I'll do it. But I'm not going to advertise that. I'm not going to spend half an hour and dial in a preset and then put it up on a storefront and expect everybody to pay $5 a piece for it. That I don't agree with that at all. And, you know, I, I'm kind of wishy-washy on the way that some of these companies support that ecosystem and support that sub-business. In one way, you know, the Kemper Profiler was built around that. And I'm totally cool with paying $5 for a profile versus $1,600 for that tube amp, when I can pretty much get that sound. I, I get that argument, but at the same time, I would much rather spend that extra $5 towards an entirely different amp modeling system that has all that built in already, where I don't have to rely on someone else. And when I can turn up the, the gain control, it actually reacts the same and, and all these things. So I like the Kemper as like a library of tones. I like it as the producer's mindset of, hey, I recorded this band and before they leave, I really liked that tone they were getting out of their amps. So I'm gonna profile it, ta-da, I have it forever. Or I want to travel halfway across the world with my band and I cannot afford to either lose this amplifier or I literally can't afford to take it with me because of weight concerns. Whatever. I'll profile it. I got all my effects done. There's my back line. Makes total sense. But for someone that is interested in amp modeling and you're just now getting started, this is not it. <laughs> and I think with the Quad Cortex being out as imperfect as it is right now, there's no doubt about it. Um, but they're just getting started. You know, I have I have plenty of my concerns, plenty of my um, critiques about their marketing and all that. But just as a product, there's some things they're already doing that surpasses the Kemper, and there's just so many other options that I, I'm having a hard time coming up with people to recommend this product to that don't already have it. So that's pretty much that. Um, extremely interesting piece of gear, not for everybody. I it's not changed my mind. I, I definitely think I, I made the decision that was right for me. Uh, five, six years ago in terms of uh, going the the route that I did for amp modeling. But on the same token, do I think it, it still deserves to be in some of the, you know, among the most important guitar gear in this decade, in this century? Absolutely. I mean, this thing was a game changer in a lot of ways, even if it was built off of purportedly older technology. But that's a discussion for another day. Anyways, Hopefully, there's no way you guys have more questions because I don't know how much longer I could talk about the Kemper. Um, but there will at least be one more video, perhaps two, that uh, concern this and, and some other stuff out there. But uh, thank you for watching this. This was an absolute undertaking. It spiraled out of control as it normally does, but I wanted to get the most out there that I, I thought was important that people weren't talking about. So Kemper Profiler, PSS edition. Thanks so very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.